Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. And this is the text I wanted to start from last week. And I accidentally started from another telling of the tale, but from another gospel. But this is the, this is the, this is the telling of the tale that I was wanting to use last week as I finally think. So I'm going to repeat it this evening just to once again lay the foundation of this message and then hopefully we'll keep this message more brief than last week, but we want to complete what we had started last week. Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13, and the word of the Lord reads, first of all, may I ask you to stand please with me in honor of the reading of God's word. Amen. Thank you. Beginning at verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Last week I began to talk to us on the subject of making mountains out of low hills, and I guess so we can approach it slightly differently tonight, I'm going to approach this subject matter tonight upon this rock. Amen. Master, we thank you for this place. We thank you for this opportunity to be here. We thank you, God, for your presence. Lord, for the very presence of angels. Lord, that you would send and encourage us, for your word declares that they are ministering spirits sent to minister on behalf of the people of God. Lord, tonight, give us boldness. Give us, Lord, all that we need to deliver this message and its full uh, form. God, with every word that you have spoken, having been spoken, and nothing having been missed. Master, this is an important message, and we ask you, Lord God, today, to set our soul on fire, not only to speak it, but Lord, those that would hear it, set us on fire to receive the truth, that it might liberate us in ways we've never before known, for we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God. And amen. You may be speaking. We were talking last week about the... about this story, if you recall, that I had used in another text. And it wasn't quite as in-depth and detailed as this text was. But we had covered several major points, and I'm, I'm going to try to breeze over them real quick. We talked about, first of all, the fact that Jesus asked the question, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Why did Jesus Christ use the phraseology, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? When you say Son of Man, all you're saying is a human being. That's all you're saying. You're saying that that individual is, is, is human. That's a question of but Jesus Christ, in asking the question this way, he was specifically making his disciples look at him in terms of his humanity. He said, now I'm standing here in front of you, flesh and blood, you can touch me, you can feel me, you can talk to me. I understand that that creates a problem sometimes. See, the reason a lot of people couldn't understand who Jesus was is because of the fact that he was standing in front of them flesh and blood. They, 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 that alone was enough of an obstacle for them that they couldn't possibly overcome it in understanding the truth of his identity. So this is why Jesus, he kind of magnified his humanity by saying, 
Who do they say? Who do they say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, some say in, in more in terms of flesh and blood and humanity, in terms of, of, of human terms, well, some say Elias, and some say Jeremiah, and some say John the Baptist, and well, you know, they were very flattering. They all thought he was somebody great. Amen. They all thought he was somebody great. No matter who they thought he was, they thought he was somebody of notoriety. They thought he was somebody special. But they still couldn't quite figure it out. You know, that reminded me of one time in the scriptures where the Lord had a similar conversation with his disciples. And that was in Luke chapter 11. He had a similar experience. In Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 29, and the word of the Lord states, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall be no sign, uh, and no sign shall be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man, again he uses the term Son of Man, not referring to himself as the Son of God, be to this generation, the Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Hallelujah. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Ooh, my Lord have mercy. You see, the problem Jesus had was everybody could look at him and they could see him as being a Solomon. They could see him as being a Jonah. They could see him as being an Elias. They could see him as being a John the Baptist. And all the while, what they could not see was that a greater than these was in the midst of them. A far greater, a much greater than these was standing before them, but they could not see his greatness, for they were too busy focusing on his humanity. My will have mercy. So focusing on his humanity, not understanding that his humanity was the vehicle whereby redemption would be brought to mankind. Paul the Apostle said, For by one man sin entered into the world. That was Adam number one. Am I telling the truth? Yes. But Paul said that by the second man, by the second Adam, sin would be removed. The blight of sin would be removed from mankind. So the reality is that the humanity of the man Jesus Christ was merely the vehicle whereby redemption would be attained for all of human time. And where most people cannot understand the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ is because they cannot understand that he has unique to himself unlike any other human being in the history of the world. A dual nature. He was absolutely human. He had to be. To die on a cross, you had to be human. You couldn't die on a cross and be God. Amen. So the humanity had to be there. But God is not a man, the scriptures tell us, that he survived. God is not human. God is not flesh and blood. But at the same time, Unlike any other human being in the history of humanity, Jesus Christ, the man, embodies God Almighty to the very core of his soul. And therefore, he had a dual nature. He was human, and yet he was at the same identical time divine. He was at some times the Son of God, and at other times the Son of Man. Hello now. And this was something people could not fathom. 
They couldn't understand it. They couldn't get it through their head. Now we've got gurus running all over the world today. This fellow over there in Tibet, you know, who comes over here and drives his Rolls Royces and wears his little robes and sandals, you know, and everybody wants to touch him. And there's this lady from India that was recently in Dallas, and people claim that if she just hugs you, oh, such a peace comes over you. It's not even real. It's just an incredible peace. Even those who claim not to be believers, even some who claim to have Christians, allowed this woman to hug her and said that such a peace come over them that it was otherworldly. They couldn't understand where it came from. Because these people believe in God occupying a physical form. God existing in a physical human being. You see, the Hindus believe in this. Amen. The Buddhists believe in this. You see, they all believe in this. But you see, what they fail to understand is that Jesus Christ did not claim to be a son of God, or a God man as it were, or a divine revelation of God in human form, but he said that he would be he was the only begotten Son of God. He was the only man that God himself ever conceived in human form and gave birth to and caused to be full of himself. So therefore, all these others are fakes and phonies because he's the only begotten Son of God. The only one. There are no others. The Buddhists believe there's one in every generation. There's a Buddha. There's a living Buddha. In every generation, there's a living Buddha. But there's a God-man. There's an individual who is God. And then, and Scott may look a little like Buddha, but he does, I don't think he's qualified by their standards. Amen. You know, they saw his humanity and they could not understand his divinity for his humanity. But even in John chapter 19 and 19, we read how the pirate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But all for any human being, then or now, that looks at the man Jesus Christ and reduces him nearly to the King of the Jews, that reduces him nearly to a human being, a flesh and blood form, all but a great mistake is made. For my friend, I've got news for you. He is not the King of the Jews. He was not then, nor is he now the King of the Jews. Herod and Pilate uh, did not fear Israel's king, but it didn't matter either way. As a human being, he was subject to their dominion and authority. However, in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, we read something that helps us understand just exactly who this Jesus was. Beginning in verse 11, the apostle John writes, and I saw heaven open, and behold the white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with the vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of its mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nation. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. You see, he is not the King of the Jews. He is the King of Kings. Every king, every majesty, every power, every government that has ever existed in human existence right through this time will one day kneel before the presence of Jesus Christ and acknowledge that he is king of kings and lord of lords. And my Bible says that every tongue shall confess that he is lord. 
is in peace, God Almighty Himself. In the Old Testament, God made it great. I am the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord thy God is one Lord. And beside me, there is no other. Now, he was writing this at the time of when human beings were already in existence, when human beings had already been created, when human history had already begun. So some false doctrine that would tell you that Jesus Christ was created as a God-like being after the fact for the purpose of salvation and that God is saying, I am the Lord thy God is that type me there is no other. Well, the reason he's saying that is he hasn't created Jesus yet. No, that's not why he's saying it. <laughs> As you find out later that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is that one God that was talked about in the Old Testament. He is that one God that was called Lord. I've got news for you. God declared himself throughout the Old Testament to be Israel's Savior. And he declared simply in Isaiah, and beside me there is no Savior. Hallelujah. So that means, my friend, that either God is a liar, or the man Jesus Christ is a liar, or Jesus Christ the man was God. Hallelujah. It's simple, it's hard, it's easy. If God declares himself alone to be the Savior, and then Jesus Christ is declared the Savior, where is the contradiction? I'll tell you there is no contradiction, especially when you understand that the apostle, I believe it was Titus, who declared that we await the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He made it plain and simple that we were waiting for the appearance of both our God and our Savior. We were not waiting for one or the other. We were waiting for both, and they would both appear in the single person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Hosea 13 and 4, Yes, I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no other God but me. Thou shalt know no other God but me. Even if Jesus Christ were created as some God being, after the fact, the God would be asking us to know another God but himself. And he said, Thou shalt not know any God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. In the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verse 47, the salutations uh, that the writers were giving, most of the time these, these phrases are found in their salutations to the churches. Luke 1, 47, 1 Timothy 1 and 1, 1 Timothy 2 and 3, 1 Timothy 4 and 10, Titus 1 and 3, Titus 2 and 10, Titus 3 and 4, 2, Verse 25, the word of the God speaks for the Lord Jesus Christ as God our Savior. Jesus Christ was crucified for his claims of divinity. John 5, 18, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he was not because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Again, if you don't understand the phraseology of the Jews, if you don't understand the way they write and what they're trying to say, then you would miss this maybe. But if I take a great big chalkboard up here, and on this side, I draw a set of numbers, two plus two. And in the middle, I have an equal sign. And over here, I draw a four. What I am saying is that the equation that you see on this side is identical 
Amen. Absolutely identical to what you see on the opposite side of the equal sign. So when the Jew said he makes himself to be equal with God by claiming that he has a work with Father, but that the Spirit of God alone lives and abode within his breast, he was claiming that he was equal with God, or that this physical man was on this side of the equation, and God was on this side of the equation, and that they were one of the twins. Amen. And that's why they crucified him, my friend. The Jews crucified him because they knew who it came to be. They just didn't have the revelation to your head. We talked about the need for revelation last week. Philippians 2, chapter 5 and 8, uh, chapter 5, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, Paul is not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he could have come as God. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, his humanity. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. There was a lot more power and ability to be that man than anybody could ever agree. You know the old song that says he could have called 10,000 angels. Oh my blessed God, he could have called them down from glory to take him off that cross. But the Bible says that he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. My Lord have mercy. We talked about the fact last night, and uh, last week, I should say, God wants to make mountains out of molehills. He wants to take people that the devil didn't care about, and he wants to make you the enemy of your soul's biggest headache. Amen. He wants to make you so grievous to Satan that Satan cannot sleep at night, as it were, for thoughts of you. Amen. But if this is to be accomplished, then honey, you have better build on a sure foundation. And you better build on the right foundation. If this God is going to make a mountain out of your old hill, if he's going to make building material out of you, if he is going to make something out of you that he can use as part of the structure of his church, then I've got news for you. You need to build on the right foundation. Matthew 7, 24 and 25, Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the flood came, and the wind blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. The identity of the Lord Jesus Christ has throughout all of human history been a mystery. Paul the Apostle declares plainly in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He did not say the Son of God was manifest in the flesh. If the Son were a separate person, then Paul just made a grievous error in not stating clearly that it was not God who was manifest in the flesh. It was not Jehovah God who was manifest in the flesh, but rather it was merely another aspect of God or another person of God or another creation of God. But that's not what Paul said. He said God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed God in the world, and received up into glory. Honey, I don't know about you, but it sounds to me like he just described the life and time of one man we call Jesus. Those of us who have been called to God's service, those of us who have been called to the truth, those of us who have been called to be saved, have been given the ability to know the mystery of the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 and 11, the scripture reads, And the disciples came and said unto him, speaking of Jesus, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. Remember what we said about Revelation? If God hasn't revealed it to you, honey, I can talk to our people and you'll never get it. You'll never see it. You'll never understand it. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul said, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If this gospel is tight, if it's hard to understand, if it's hard to read, if it's hard to gather, if you can't get it, he said, all the people that's hard to understand and hard to read for are those that are lost. In whom the God of this world, speaking of course of Satan, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light or the illumination of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God should shine unto them. Now how much clearer can anybody make it? I think the Apostle Paul made his position about as clear as anybody could ever make it. Christ, who is the image of God. Do you know what that is to anybody who might read this from a Jewish perspective? Idolatry. To say that the man Jesus Christ was the image of God is idolatry. Ephesians chapter 3, 1 through 5. Let's read what Paul said about his own experience coming into this thing. He said, for this cause, I call the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. <laughs> As I wrote before in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages or times was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by his Spirit. So you see, the revelation of Jesus Christ is something that we must all experience if God's going to be able to make anything of us in terms of our spiritual existence and our spiritual life. Look at Saul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of his letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this Christian way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them down unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there signs round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? There's not a Jew on this planet that would ever utter the, the word Lord, looking heavenward, and not seeing the face, but just being in a divine light, except that he believed he was speaking to God. And it's funny because the voice on the other end of this conversation didn't correct him. Oh, no, 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 you're not talking to the Lord. <laughs> oh, no, 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 this is only Jesus. <laughs> Now the voice on the other end of the conversation said, and he said, Paul, Saul, that is, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for me to kick against the purse. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. 
And the men which journeyed with him, with Saul, stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no man. Hallelujah. So see, Jesus as God <laughs> was more potent and powerful and precious than he ever was as a man. Amen. My Lord, have mercy. Old Testament prophets declare the testimony of Scripture concerning the identity of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. What did Jesus say? He said, he said about Jonah, he said, Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, didn't he? He said, this one was a sign to that one. He said, well, honey, I got news. He said, I'm a sign to this generation. For the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Which means what? God with us. So you see, from the very beginning, the Jewish people knew that their Messiah was to be their God. But Jesus wasn't doing things the way they wanted it done. And they said, well, if we send him back, he'll come back and do it again the way we want it done. What a bunch of arrogant fools. Hey, I hate to say it that way, but just what arrogant foolishness. Amen? Part of Joseph's visitation by the angel, the angel speaking with Joseph, Matthew 1, 23, The whole of virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, the angel said, which being interpreted is God with us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, not to God. God didn't have a son. We're the ones that had a son. Hallelujah. Under all a child is born. Unto all a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You know there are false doctrines out there today that try to dissect and misrepresent this scripture so disgustingly as to suggest that Jesus is maybe the mighty God, but Jehovah is the almighty God. Talk about splitting heads, huh? But interestingly enough, it says in this verse also that that same one whom we would call Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God. But it also mother tells us that he be called the everlasting Father. So you know what? Their little false doctrine gets blown right out of the water if anybody would care to read their own Bible for themselves and look at it for themselves instead of somebody telling them what everything's supposed to mean. Because the same one who's the mighty God, my friend, is also the everlasting Father. There are not two fathers. Well, but Jehovah God the Father created Jesus the Son, and Jesus the Son became the Father of humanity by creating the world under the order of Jehovah God the Father. But that can't possibly be true. Because it was Jehovah God who declared that I alone and the Lord my God to his people Israel. He said, and beside me there is no Savior. I alone am your God, and beside me there is no other. I alone am your God, and beside me there is no God. So no matter how to slice this, he made it plain that he was either all or nothing. Hallelujah. He was either everything or he was nothing at all. My Lord, have mercy. See, there are certain religious sects in the world today that want to forget the fact that Christianity is born out of Judaism. They want to forget the fact that if Judaism did not first exist, Christianity could not possibly exist. And they have rewritten the Bible to make it say everything they want to say and have completely ignored 
the Jewish roots of God's church, and it's the Jewish heritage of God's people. But you know, just like Abraham, whom the Bible declared that was seeking a city whose builder and maker was God. <laughs> he was looking for something better than just what this life had to offer, and Abraham was well to do. But it said he saw the city whose builder and maker was God. But Jesus said to us before he left, he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. But he said, but if I go and prepare a place for you, Oh, Abraham, I got news for you. You know who the builder of that city that you're headed for is? His name is Jesus. You know who that Jesus is? <laughs> you're headed for a city who's built on the of God. You got that right. You got that right. But the wonderful thing about it is he did not leave himself off in a cloud somewhere, unable to be known or understood by humanity, but rather he came and revealed himself in the most clear and wonderful terms so that we might know him just as easily as, as knowing another person. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word, logos. The word logos in the Greek literally means an expressed thought, a spoken word, or an idea. In the beginning was the word has nothing to do with a person. And Trinitarians make the same mistake because they try to represent Logos as a person. It has nothing to do with a person. God had a son in the beginning. And when you understand this scripture properly, it makes perfect sense because in the beginning was the word, the plan, the idea, and the word was with God. God had the work with him. He had the plan with him. He had the idea with him from the beginning. And the word was God. He himself was included in the plan. He himself was part of the idea. It's so simple that you think when you try a lot of things, you know what makes me laugh a lot of times? It doesn't make me laugh, it breaks my heart. You get groups like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and they run around preaching some of these, these heresies and these doctrines they preach. And they couldn't even preach that crap if the Catholic Church hadn't given them the false doctrine to springboard off of. Because that's what they've done. They've actually taken a dive off of a platform that was established hundreds of years ago by the Roman Catholic Church. They're not doing anything new. Their doctrines are built on concepts that the Roman Catholic Church has put in place. And yet if you ask them, they'll claim they have absolutely no connection and no resemblance to the Catholic Church or anything. And honey, you're so wrong, it's not even funny. Because you could not possibly believe that Jesus Christ was a separate individual from God the Father that he was anything other than God manifest in human form, you could not possibly believe that at all if it weren't for all the ideologies that have been produced over the centuries to help support the Trinitarian misnomer. Because you're using half of them yourself to support your misnomer. John 14, 8, almost done. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Uh, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believe it thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The Bible said that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The, the word that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. You see, the, the flesh was merely a puppet. It was merely a tool that God had to create in order to accomplish his end. But the spirit and the soul of that man, Jesus Christ, was God. 
You only think human about him what? His flesh. That's it. The only thing about him that was human was his flesh and blood. Remember John 2, 6 and 7, the water being turned into wine at the wedding of Canaan and Galilee? Remember in Luke chapter 17, 11 through 14, the healing of the ten lepers. Remember Luke 18, 35 through verse 42, the healing of the blind man. Remember John chapter 11, the resurrection of Lazarus, the Lord's friend. Remember in Mark chapter 4, 35 through 41, the Lord is uh, said to have calmed the raging red sea by the word of his mouth. Remember John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. Jesus is found walking on the water. Remember Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. The deliverance of the demoniac in the tomb. Who else but God could do these things? Colossians 1.19, for it reaches the Father that in him, being Jesus, should all fullness dwell. Colossians 1.16 states, for by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth. All things. That means he would have here created all the angels. That means he would have here created all the cherubim. That means he would have speak up and sit right here. For by him were, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Speaking of Jesus, my friend, any, any false doctrines have got to just flee out your mind because the truth stands alone and it cannot be competed with. Amen. Colossians 2 and 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How much pleasure could the apostles of Christ have spoken their doctrine and said who they thought that he was and who they believed Jesus to be? I preach this message because this is the very beginning of our church. And I'm going to tell you in a prophetic sense. The Lord declared plainly that the closer we come to the last time, he said that his church would suffer great persecution for his name's sake. And mother, a lot of people have misunderstood. They don't understand what's going to happen. They don't know that this thing's coming to a head. There's going to be a showdown. His apostolic one God Jesus name message and that old Trinitarian message are going to go head to head one day and then it's going to, one's going to stand and the other one ain't because they ain't ruling this world for the both of them. And those who preach the Jesus name message are those who preach the oneness of God. You don't see people preaching Jesus name the way that Jesus name folks do in Trinitarian circles. No, because see, their understanding of God is so misconstrued and screwed up. But they haven't pulled it together. They haven't understood. They haven't gotten it down. It's all in the name. You see, that name is like, it's like the tip of a funnel. That's where it all comes down to, the name. Because the name is the revelation of his divinity. The name is the revelation of his salvation. The name is, 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 it is the most potent point where humanity and divinity have ever met is in the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, when it comes to persecution, when it comes to trouble in the last days, he said, do you know where it's all going to stem from? He said, my name's sake. It's all going to have to do with my name. You know what, Tommy, honey, I got news for you. Ain't they a person in hell going to care? There's not going to be a single one before Jesus comes that's going to want to fight over who Jehovah is. But they're going to be killing God's people over the name and identity of Jesus Christ. The Lord said they'll deliver you up to kings, to priests, to councils. They'll deliver you in the synagogues for my name's sake. You're not going to have to defend Jehovah. You're not going to have to defend Buddha. You're not going to have to defend Hare Krishna or anybody else. But honey, you're going to have to defend the name of Jesus. 
And when you look in the book of Revelation, in closing, 